Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. Um, we are turning our attention to S-224, an act relating to juvenile proceedings. And we have three witnesses this afternoon. And I'm so glad to see all of you. My apologies for having to reschedule you for, I think it must be at least the third time. Um, we had a busy week last week, but I'm really glad to see you. And um, we will start with um, Network and uh, Oscar Barquist. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, all. Welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Jessica Barquist, and I am the Director of Policy and Organizing at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Nice to see you all this afternoon. So, the network is deeply appreciative of the work of the legislature and also the juvenile justice stakeholders group on a number of issues related to juvenile justice. And we are really committed to the overall purpose and direction of the juvenile justice reforms and support S-224 in this draft. Uh, policy changes related to raise the age and youthful offender have really helped to move our legal responses to criminal behavior among our emerging adult population to be in greater alignment with our criminal justice reform efforts and the neurobiology of what's happening for our emerging adults. And so advances in neuroscience have really demonstrated that the brain is not fully developed until an individual is in their 20s. Um, and that that adolescent and emerging adulthood brain is just really highly responsive to that risk-taking peer influence and reward systems. And, you know, we're also deepening our understanding of the impacts of trauma on the lives of youth and the ways that responses to trauma can really manifest as these harmful or even criminal behaviors. And so we believe that it's essential that youth who create, who commit crimes, have access to these resources and interventions outside of these traditional criminal legal responses, and that the goal of these responses ought to be that rehabilitation and support. And you know, while Vermont has moved for forward with these really important juvenile justice reforms, um, implementation in them has really revealed that more work needed to be done to ensure that victims' rights are upheld as those policies evolve. And, you know, as a matter of process, as we're raising the age, um, you know, next to 19, but eventually up to 22, you know, we've already seen and we anticipate further growth in the number of domestic and sexual violence related cases that are gonna be appearing in family court. And in domestic and sexual violence cases, you know, Oftentimes these victims are also emerging adults or adolescents, and they're in those same critical stages of brain development. And so they really need to be afforded that same care and consideration as the person that has caused them that harm. So as we consider making changes to the process to better support offenders, it's also essential that we take a look at the experience of victims and ensure that the process works well for them too. So once um, raise the age has been fully implemented to age 22. This process will involve almost all campus sexual assaults, as well as many dating and domestic violence cases, sometimes even between married individuals. Domestic and sexual violence are intimately personal crimes, as you all well know, and victim involvement in these court proceedings is often essential for the victim's healing and safety, as well as for the offender's learning and rehabilitation. And in our existing statute and structure within family court, victims have very little opportunity to engage with the process or even to really be informed about what's happening in their cases. Um, and that is why the changes that are being made here in S-224 are so critical. Um, it's a really strong bill that would remedy a lot of the inequities that victims experience within the juvenile court system. Um, while still maintaining that strong confidentiality and support for the juvenile. And so um, feel free to stop me at any time, but I'm going to walk through some of the sections and, and why they're particularly important for us. Um, and the first is uh, section three, which is victim compensation. And I know my colleague Jennifer Pullman will speak more to this. Um, but when records are sealed or expunged as part of that family court process, we unintentionally prohibit victims from accessing the Victims' Compensation Fund, which is run by the Center for Crime Victim Services. 
and it allows victims to pay for various expenses related to their traumatic experiences, um, including <clears throat> therapy. And oftentimes, especially for our younger adults, um, it can be months or several years before a victim is ready for that therapy and reaches out for that financial support. Um, and so the center is unable to administer those funds without any official records documenting their status as a victim. And so the language in section three allows the compensation program to administer these funds even well after the cases are expunged. And then the next section I'll talk about is actually section five through 12. And these sections increase a victim's notification of and access to proceedings um, for all of the do ver various domestic and sexual violence cases that would fall under both raise the age and youthful offender. Um, so currently, as it stands, victims have very little right to notification regarding these raise the age cases. Victims have a right to conditions that apply directly to them, such as the no contact orders. Um, but they're not privy to those other conditions that might help them stay safe, such as general information about whether the individual is receiving intervention in their community or maybe out of state in a, a treatment facility. And we are aware of some cases of sexual violence in the state where the victim and the offender uh, attended the same high school and those victims were not notified when the offender returned to the school. And those sorts of changes in status are just really important for victims and their safety planning. Um, and so, you know, we've heard of several instances in which victims have felt the need to use the civil relief from abuse process um, to gain that measure of safety because they don't have access to see all of these conditions through the family court raise the age process. And this is really a duplication of court efforts and can easily be streamlined by increasing that transparency of conditions for victims, which is what this bill does. And similarly, victims, their attorneys and their victim advocates need to be able to be notified of and have the ability to attend all of the relevant court proceedings regarding their case. Currently, um, victims are allowed to provide a victim impact statement at the disposition hearing, and then they might be called in at any point to testify during the process as the court deems necessary. And when their attorneys are not privy to that process, it makes, them, it makes it extremely difficult for them to be able to counsel their clients regarding testimony or how they wanna present in court. Um, and we're hearing that many victims just opt not to participate because of that lack of context about the case and um, just really a lack of ability to engage in that process. Um, and uh, you had, I think you heard testimony from DCF regarding this notification process and um, hoping that the, the language in this bill would change back to their current system of notification, which is an opt-in system. The victims have to fill out a form to be notified of these things. And this language is a much more inclusive opt-out system um, that mirrors what we have in the criminal division. And um, we certainly appreciate DCF's concerns regarding their capacity and you know just the amount of effort that an opt-out notification system could be um, but this notification is really absolutely critical for victims, and we really support the language as is in the bill and hope it remains that way. Um, and, you know, in our juvenile justice stakeholders group, both the center and the network have reached out to DCF and um, let them know that we would gladly support any proposals that would um, increase their capacity to be able to support victims and to ease those administrative burdens related to notification. <laughs> However, the notifications that we're asking for, such as when an individual flees from a treatment program or moves to a community in which a victim resides, we feel like these are absolutely critical to a victim's safety planning. And it's similar to um, when this committee recognized that the importance of this notification uh, when offenders are in the custody of the Department of Mental Health um, last year with the bill S3. And it's 
similar process. We just think it's really critical that these same rights be afforded to victims who find themselves within the juvenile justice system. Um, and then the last piece I want to touch on with you all is regarding confidentiality. We know confidentiality, um, a strong confidentiality is such a need in these juvenile cases and fully support that. Um, and this confidentiality is often a benefit to our victims as well. And so we fully support both the state and DCF needing to uphold strict confidentiality in these cases. However, that confidentiality should not be a burden that victims are asked to bear. Um, you know, we've heard from some victims advocates across the state that victims, when they're involved in family court cases, either through race, the age, or youthful offenders, um, that they're being told by prosecutors that they can't talk to anyone about their experience or name their offender, and that if they do so, um, they could be charged with contempt of court. And we know that talking with trusted family members and friends and therapists is a really essential part of the healing process for many victims. And our youth victims should not fear criminal repercussions because they're engaging in that natural and normal part of healing from their traumatic experiences. In adult court and adult criminal cases, you know, even if an offender is tried and not found guilty, um, there, there's really nothing that prevents a victim from talking about their experiences. And so we need to afford that same right and consideration to our victims in the family court process. Excuse me, so just to that, um, I just wanna make sure that um, that section that you're referring to. Yeah. Is that? It's, so it's section 7 um, C on page 6, um, and then you can find it again in section 12 E for the youthful offender status. Um, and I will say that find, finding the right language for this was a difficult process for the juvenile justice stakeholders group. Um, and it was the language you see here in this bill was the result of many hours of consideration and compromise by that group. Um, and we do believe that this language does strike that needed balance between the confidentiality needed to, up, to be upheld in these proceedings and uh, the rights of victims. Thank you. Oh. And that's all I have for you. Happy to take any questions. And um, thank you so much for your consideration and your efforts to advance these policies that increase safety for victims. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions? No, nope. nope. I'm not seeing any. So great. Thank you. Good, good to see you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Hey, Jennifer, good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry, Martin. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I do have a question on, on um, page six uh, in that section seven. So <clears throat> when it talks about uh, prohibiting a victim from discussing underlying facts of the alleged offense, uh, that resulted in death. The, uh, apparently, there's more. There's a victim than. Could you define what victim means? Because obviously, a victim can't discuss it if the victim is dead. Uh, but but I, I'm assuming that it's a broader definition of victim that makes that make sense. Yes, victim is defined in here, and it is mentioned in the bill. Let me find that for you. Yeah, I may have overlooked that. Sorry. Definition. Evan might be able to, or Eric might be able to find it faster than yeah, me. No, that, that's I know fine. it's our standard victim definition. No, and, and that's that's fine. The, the, the main thing is that uh, an offense that resulted in a death other than the victim we're talking about right right at that point, I assume. And I see Jennifer has her. Yeah, Jennifer, yeah. yes. Um, I might be able to help a little bit. We define victim in our victim's compensation statute um, when it's a, when the victim is, um, the direct victim is a victim of homicide. And that usually refers to immediate family members, such as grandparents, siblings, parents, um, step parents, and the like. Great. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. And with that, um, we'll welcome Jennifer back. <laughs> you are. Good afternoon. Hi. 
Good afternoon, committee, um, and uh, thank you for your time today. For the record, my name is Jennifer Pullman. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, and um, we're deeply appreciative of you taking up um, this bill. It's been a bill that feels like a, a labor of love that's been worked on um, long and hard, and I do want to um, echo what Attorney Paul uh, testified to last week that in the 20, almost 20 years I've been doing this in Vermont, as far as policy work, this has been the most positive um, collaborative initiative that I've been involved in. Um, it's really been a wonderful um, thing to be involved in, to be working with people who, again, come with their own headsets, their own constituencies, and to have us figure out a way to hammer out um, so many pieces that have um, significant impact for um for youth and for the system and, and for <clears throat> so I do want to echo that and the center certainly does support the reforms that have been happening over the past few years with respect to our emerging adults I myself had my first paying job um, as an as a attorney representing um, young people in Boston and the surrounding area and with a couple of hundred um, kids that I had on my caseload um, First, it was kind of interesting to me that I don't remember ever seeing a victim of crime or ever hearing um, any anything from any victims of those delinquent acts. But also um, with those young people, I saw firsthand the impact of trauma, the impact of poverty, the impact of um, un uh, unaddressed mental health needs. And um, you know, I still remember, I think just about every single kid that I worked with and they have a, will always have a place in my heart. So I'm, I'm really appreciative of the work that this um, this bill is doing and that also that the legislature is doing. Um, when you look at this bill, it certainly does have a lot of pieces that speak to victims' rights. And I think in part, and I think that the stakeholders recognize that that's in part due to the fact that while we were really focused on reforms in terms of helping our emerging adults, we really didn't have victims' rights sort of keeping pace with that. Um, and I think that especially was highlighted as we looked at raising the age um, as well. So I think it was just an open understanding amongst the group that we really hadn't kept pace and that this was important to do as well um, while we we're expanding the work that we're doing with emerging adults to again, make sure that victims' voices do have a, 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 a place that they are heard um, and in a way that also balances that with the particular rights that we look at when we, or considerations we have when we think about young people. Um, I'd like to um, turn to the bill specifically, and I won't spend a lot of time duplicating what Ms. Barks has already testified to, but there are some particular pieces that I do want to address. First, with respect to compensation, this language is familiar to you all from H-534. Um, as you know, for us, um, victims' compensation, when they receive a claim, does need to engage in activities to verify the claim, verify those expenses before we can pay out. And if a record is sealed, we don't have access to that affidavit. And you'll notice that, um, of course, the information would, um, that we would receive would have be redacted of all information identifying the young person. And I think, especially with respect to um, young people, where the sealing happens that much more than in some of the issues and areas we contemplated at H-534, where that might not be till years down the road. When we're dealing with younger people, that could be happening a lot more quickly. And as Ms. Park was alluded to, um, especially for younger victims, um, trauma and those kinds of considerations don't often, aren't often recognized until a year, a couple of years down the road. And we wanna make sure that we have that opportunity open for victims to be able to file for compensations so that we can support them in that process. I do want to turn to restitution, um, and that shows up in section four, um, starting on page two. And Representative Donnelly, um, last week, I believe it was, raised a great point in that um, by including this provision at the bottom of two, um, page two um, in subsection E, in no way, shape, or form are we looking to supplant or um, change the way in which restorative programs do their work. Frankly, from the restitution unit's perspective, they do the best job of uh, making sure that uh, young people are able to pay and to pay um, as they can. So what our purpose was in terms of adding this language was that oftentimes when we see a restorative justice program get involved, whether it be diversion, um, barge, or some other uh, program, that sometimes the court can just say, just refer that whole determination over to the restorative program and not actually issue an order. And why that's problematic for us is that when um, 
you know, in some cases, we see young people staying <clears throat> uh, caseload, DCF caseload, longer than they should because that restitution hasn't been collected. And um, while they can be discharged, the DC, DCF still has to, if there's outstanding restitution, DCF then has to go back to the court and actually get that restitution judgment order in order for the young person to be discharged. And our hope is that the judge taking into consideration the ability of the juvenile to pay, we don't want this to be punitive, can issue that order at the outset such that DCF can then simply say, or diversion um, restorative program can simply say, we're done with this young person on our caseload. And then when they turn 18, that restorative, that restitution judgment order stays in place. So it saves that extra step of going back to the court. It facilitates the um, discharge of a young person from a caseload and then just leaves it between the young person and the restitution unit um, to basically figure out how to pursue um, collection of that restitution judgment order. So it kind of is a simplification and that young person does have the ability to modify that restitution judgment order at any point in time. So simply because it was put in place at one point doesn't mean that that's uh, in existence in perpetuity. There are processes for modification of those orders. So again, in no way do we want to take the restorative processes that are so effective out of the equation. We simply are looking at it as a way of simplifying what we do and simplifying what DCF is asked to do. Um, and that was our goal in terms of um, having that language put in place. Um, Selena has a question. Or yeah, my, this might be a little in the weeds, but I'm just trying to fully understand. So these, these um, you know, the juvenile cases could still be referred to a restorative justice program, but this is just saying that the restitution order wouldn't be kind of handled at the discretion of that program, but rather that the... Well, the program could still figure out with the young person a way in which that they would um, work on payment um, in, the, in those cases. But if it comes to the point where the diversion program, let's say, has said, we've done all we can with this young person. There's only restitution that remains. Um, that judgment order would still be in existence, so that would not be a bar to them saying, young person, you've done your work, and um, we're going to close this case. So it would um, still let them be the driver in terms of working with that young person to facilitate the collection. And again, we don't want to step in to that process. They do an amazing job. We have a great relationship with them and we don't want to step into that process. We just want to make that closure piece a lot more efficient. Right, and as I'm reading the language more closely that's being struck, because I was, I think I was misreading it and thinking that it, it was um, removing some discretion decision making from an RJ like a restorative justice program and and putting it on the courts but even this language that's being struck it was still saying the court would make that decision about sort of ultimately about how you know anyway I think I've answered my own question I'm sorry but but thank you for clarifying And then um, finally, the other restitution provision um, is on page uh, three, that's in K um, to three. And again, that's, uh, if that's language that's very familiar to all of you. We've just done this with page um, 534. And it's just to clarify that, again, ceiling should not impact the ability of the restitution unit to address these orders as civil orders. Um, and it refers back to K1 and also speaks to um, decisions that have been made by court. So it's just a clarification piece. Um, Eric did the walkthrough, I mean, Attorney Fitzpatrick did the walkthrough already. Um, I do just wanna emphasize that the striking of the language um, in section five and section six which basically strikes out those that clause that victims, other than victims of active del delinquency, is a technical change, but it's also really important because even though there's been a great deal of work done to look at victims' rights in um, delinquency cases, there's still a lot of confusion amongst practitioners about what, in fact, a victim can and cannot um, do, what rights they can and cannot exercise. So I think pieces of that that are technical um, really do carry a lot of weight with practitioners. So I wanted to say how important that um, we see those provisions are. 
I do want to turn to section eight, that's on page six. This is the sort of importation of victims' rights from um, Title 13 with respect to information that victims are entitled to uh, obtain from law enforcement agencies. I wanted to just note a technical cleanup. Um, there are four areas in this section, starting on page seven, that use the term offender. And um, my suggestion would that we would want to change that language um, from offender to um, youth or young person or something um, along those lines to bring it into conformance with the rest of the of Title 33. So um, we just recommend that we look at changing that particular language um, that's in that section. Finally, I want to speak to um, the notification pieces around um, release from custody starting on um, page 10, that's section 10, page 10, um, subsection four. First, I wanna to touch upon um, something that Mrs. Parquist already alluded to, which is that opt-in versus opt-out for notification. And um, for us, it is, remains really important that this be an opt-out piece. Um, there are, you know, there was, there was a recommendation um, a few years ago um, when this, you know, these changes were happening that there'd be consideration given to uh, creating a organizational organizational capacity within DCF that would mirror what DPOC has. The Department of Corrections has four victim services specialists and one director of the services specialist that canvassed the state. And they are a just invaluable point person for victims um, and for advocates who need help, need information, need support. And unfortunately, um, DCF does not have that internal capacity right now. And what they do have, um, unfortunately, is that you have caseworkers who are wearing two hats. They are the caseworker for that young person, but then also charged with answering questions and providing support and information to victims as appropriate. And we have been very vocal about wanting to make sure that DCF has everything that they need to be able to manage the uh, ever-growing you know, responsibility that they're having with respect to these cases. But for right now, the juvenile system is a complete mystery to a victim who's trying to reach out um, to, that, to that system to get information. So given that at this point in time, we would prefer that it's an opt out. We understand that currently, or the last um, information that I had was that DCF has about 40 young people that are in this situation. Um, so our hope would be that as we continue to work on ways to support DCF um, in terms of being able to, again, realize the, the responsibilities that they are being tasked with, that in the meantime, we would have this as an opt-out provision um, for victims of listed crimes and youthful uh, offender acts. We are not interested in, um, at this point in time, tasking DCF, we understand it's quite a burden with all of the, with the opt-out, with all the notification responsibilities for non-listed crimes. And we understand that many young people who commit non-listed crimes are not actually in that uh, residential system. So we would ask that that language remain. And that is, I think, the one point on, in this entire bill where there's not complete consensus. Um, and then we did notice when we were meeting, um, actually as a stakeholder group recently, that there seems to be an incongruity in that victims of um, delinquencies that are listed crimes, again, as you can see in subsection four, uh, their right to notification is only when um, a young person is discharged from a secure, a staff secure residential facility. But then if you turn to the right that victims in non-listed crimes have, which is on page 12, um, and you'll see that in subsection five, they're notified um, upon release from a residential facility. So that's a much broader notification responsibility. And we would suggest that, um, and that also the victims of non-listed crimes have the exact same rights as victims um, when the young person is a youthful offender. So you have a much stricter um, notification responsibility when the victim is the victim of a delinquent act that was a listed crime versus a not listed. And so we would suggest that perhaps we might want to flip that um, and the rights that victims of non listed crimes have actually be afforded to those um, enlisted crimes, as you see on page 10, 
rather than the carbon state, which again has an incongruity that doesn't really make a lot of sense to us. And it didn't make any sense to our stakeholder group, but I think we realized that was one piece that I missed all of the uh, language that we considered that we just kind of all missed. So I would ask that the committee potentially consider making that um, adjustment. So those were my um, remarks for today. I certainly do appreciate and support the language that um, Ms. Barquist um, spoke to with respect to the confidentiality issues and also allowing a victim of record to be able to tell their story with respect to support people that might be able to help them through their process. And um, again, that was language that was really uh, difficult to arrive at, but after a lot of deliberation, the stakeholder group did approve that language. So I would ask that the committee consider supporting that as well. Great, thank you. Uh, well, I can get back to you. I, I think I followed where you wanna flip the, um, the language, but I have, I have notes, so if not, and I'll work with Eric, I'll, I'll get back to you. If it would be helpful, Madam Chair, I could certainly follow up with an email to yourself and the committee and or Eric, I mean, Attorney Fitzpatrick. That'd be, yeah, that, that'd be great to, to loop in Eric and then you can certainly copy me. That'd be great, thank you. Um, any questions? Um, oh, yeah, I guess I need a little help with this, Jennifer. Uh, I'm not a neuroscientist or, or a caseworker or whatever, uh, so I don't deal with, it with the children as often as I possibly should have, I guess. So when you say that the purpose of this is to raise the age to 19 and 22 also is what we're saying here? Um, Representative Norris, I believe that that's already been decided by the legislature. That okay. If that's not the purpose of this. What we're hoping for in our provisions is to bring victims' rights forward with respect to especially those cases when we're involving older youth. But I was just looking at it where it says, uh, you know, advances in neuroscience have demonstrated that the brain is not fully developed until an individual reaches their 20s. I'm assuming that's a, the that's a correct statement from the network. Yes, um, Ms. Barquist already had, had spoken to that. And, and certainly, you know, we understand that as well. Um, what we're trying to make sure is that in reflection upon the changes that this body has made, <coughs> pardon me, in recent years, that we're acknowledging that the harm to a victim is the same regardless of the age of the young person who commits the crime. So providing some avenue for um, victims to be able to be heard and participate in the process in a meaningful way is important to us. Okay. Uh, just, <clears throat> we just passed a bill the other day that I found, obviously, um, that it's not germane to this, but anyways, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay. Now turn to the state's attorneys. Good afternoon, Evan. Good to see you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation uh, to come and testify about S-224. For the record, my name is Evan Meenan, and I'm a deputy state's attorney assigned to the executive director's office of the Department of State's Attorneys. Um, the department supports S-224. Uh, it which primarily accomplishes three things. It pauses, raise the age for one year. It improves how Vermont's juvenile proceedings uh, take into consideration the, the needs of victims. And it also provides some additional guidance regarding when youthful offender status will or will not compromise public safety. Um, the department submitted a proposal to the Senate Judiciary Committee seeking some changes to Vermont's juvenile proceeding statutes. Uh, that proposal did not include um, a request to pause, raise the age. However, the state's attorneys have consistently stated that they would like the law to work successfully. And there seems to be a recognition that in order for that to occur, we need to have the systems in place to serve the juveniles that will be subject to the law. And if we need a one year pause in order to make sure that happens, the department is on board. Um, the department also agrees that the victims related provisions in this bill are appropriate and they are an improvement upon the existing law. 
And that is for all of the reasons that Jessica Barquist and Jennifer Pullman testified to earlier this afternoon, and also for all of the reasons in the network's submission dated March 25th. Um, because we're in agreement with um, them and their justification for these improvements, I'm not going to spend a lot of time this afternoon repeating them. The department also agrees that an additional guidance on uh, public safety is appropriate, and it will help both the parties and the court uh, further identify when youthful offender status should and should not be granted. The department's proposal included um, a, a few other things that are not in S-224, and I, I, I just want to make it clear for this committee, in case any of the members saw that proposal, that at this time, the department is not asking for them to be included in S-224. I spent some time uh, with Ledge Council and other stakeholders trying to come up with legislative language that would implement some of those proposals. And it became clear rather quickly that our juvenile proceeding statutes have become somewhat complex and that it's, 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 difficult to, um, it's difficult to make substantive changes without having to tinker with several different statutes. I, I think that's illustrated by the fact that we're, I think there's, I think there's 10 different statutory sections that are being amended to implement, implement these victim related improvements. So um, the department does not have anything that it would like to add to this bill at this point in time. And it's going to continue working with the other stakeholders to see if there's ways that we can improve our juvenile proceedings moving forward to the benefit of, of both the children that are su uh, subject to them and also the victims. I would like to take a moment in the hopes that it's helpful to the committee to address some of the issues that um, have been issues and questions that have been raised either during the committee's last hearing or by other stakeholders. There was a question I think at the last hearing about what happens if law enforcement impermissibly discloses confidential information. And I think the question was designed to inquire whether or not that topic needed to be addressed in this bill. And so I thought that I would point out that at a minimum, 33 VSA 5117 and 5118 appear to make that a misdemeanor offense punishable by a $2,000 fine. So current law already does address that topic. Um, regarding psychosexual evaluations, I think there was a suggestion to include the phrase as <laughs> clinically indicated in this bill. Um, that language and what it is supposed to accomplish has been discussed in the juvenile jurisdiction stakeholders work group, and the department is, is comfortable with it. It seems like the judiciary and the parties understand how it should be implemented, and hopefully it will be done uh, correctly. There was also a proposal to um, clarify the standards for revoking uh, youthful offender status pre-adjudication. In other I'm words, sorry, Evan. I just <laughs> I want to make sure I understood your last point. Were you saying that the state's attorneys feel that the current the language in the bill as passed by the Senate is adequate, and that the provi the addition of as clinically indicated is not needed, and you're comfortable without, or were you saying state's attorneys would be comfortable if the language that additional provision was added? We are we are comfortable with the addition of that language into the bill. Okay. I've had an opportunity to listen to the testimony about that language in this committee previously, and I agree that it provides some flexibility to the court to get information about whether or not requiring an individual to engage in a psychosexual evaluation would be beneficial to the court or whether or not it might be detrimental to uh, the justice involved youth who would have to participate in it. So I think the language that's been suggested is, uh, it, it's acceptable. I think it's good language and the department's comfortable with it. Thanks for your clarification. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you, that's section 16. Okay, great. Okay. Um, I think there was, my, my recollection is there was also a proposal to include a standard for revoking youthful offender status pre-adjudication. In other words, an opportunity to revoke it before there is a probation violation. And there's been some conversations in the juvenile jurisdiction stakeholders work group about, about that very topic. And it was discussed that 33 VSA 5113 and 5283E 
subsection E may already provide a mechanism for doing that, uh, doing that very thing. Um, if clarification is, is needed to make that clear, um, 5113 might be a good place to add that clarification if the committee thought that that was, that was needed. Um, 5113 refers to a change in circumstances that would justify something like this. And, you know, certainly, you know, the, 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 new, the newly proposed public safety considerations could be, could be included in there to identify what types of things might lead to a change in circumstances. So the department just wanted to point that out, that if the committee thought they, some clarification was needed, that might be a good location to insert that clarification. Um, the department agrees with both the network and the center that it would be preferable to have an opt out system for victim notification rather than an opt in system. Um, but the department is cognizant of the fact that DCF may need more resources to make that happen. And the department would be supportive of them obtaining those resources. Um, in the meantime, the department has been working with DCF to uh, specifically the department's new uh, victims coordinator to try and ensure that we're both on the same page about how the existing opt-in system should work. So that if, um, if it remains an opt-in system, we can increase the chances that victims will be getting the notifications that they want to receive. I do want to note that it's, it's not clear that this bill actually does move from an opt-in system to an opt-out system. And the reason why I say that is because there is some language on page 10, section 4. And it's interesting language. It, it strikes out the phrase upon request and states that victims um, should be notified by the agency having custody of the delinquent child before the victim is discharged from a secure or staff secured residential facility. But at the end of that same section, it says notification shall be deemed reasonable if the agency attempts to contact the victim at the address or telephone number provided to the agency in the request for notification. And that phrase request for notification, I think raises a question as to whether or not the victims still need to submit that to the department before they are entitled to the, the notification uh, contemplated in this section. So uh, I just wanted to point that it, it may not be entirely clear. Um, the department though does agree with Jennifer Pullman that it would be nice if there, if the, the notification for discharges from secure placements was the same in delinquency proceedings as it is in youthful offender proceedings, um, so that they both referred to being released from a secure or staff secured facility. Um, I believe the network also mentioned um, some disparities in the in the word discharge versus released in its written submission, and we would agree with with the network's comments as well. Um, there's, only, there's only a few more proposals that I think have been offered, one of which was to include reckless endangerment and aggravated domestic assault as offenses that the criminal division could retain jurisdiction over. Um, the department's prior proposal acknowledged that the list of big 12 offenses might be under inclusive. Um, and suggested that it be revisited, but, but the department didn't make any specific suggestions about what offenses should be included. Um, so it didn't, for example, specifically ask that either of these two offenses be added, but it does understand the safety concerns that DCF has raised, and it wants to make sure that um, all Vermont employees that work with this population remain safe. Um, so what we would note is that domestic assault, aggravated domestic assault, and reckless endangerment are already listed crimes, which may indicate that they may be more serious than some other offenses that justice-involved youth may be accused of committing. Um, the last two proposals that I'd like to touch on briefly are two that were submitted in writing by the Children and Family Council for Prevention Programs. 
Um, the first one was to suggest that um, the ability of victims to be present in this proposal should be modified so that the court has the ability to um, direct them to leave the courtroom just as the criminal division has the ability to direct a, a victim to leave the courtroom pursuant to 13 BSA 5309. However, th this bill already does that. And I just, I just wanted to point that out. 5309 references Vermont rule of evidence 615 as a mechanism for asking a victim to leave court. And page nine of this bill, which um, is section 5234A3, and page 13 of the bill, which is 5288A2, um, provide that same reference to Vermont Rule of Evidence 615. So I, I think this bill may already do what the council was asking in that recommendation. Um, the council also wanted the victim's ability to attend court hearings and to express, well, to express their views concerning the offense and the youth to be limited to disposition hearings. And that uh, suggestion pertains to some language on page nine, section three. This, this, bill would, this bill would amend that section to say that victims can be present during all court proceedings subject to the provisions of rule 615, as I just discussed, and to express reasonably the victim's views concerning the offense and the youth. And it appears that the council wanted to limit that ability to, for a victim to express his or her views to the disposition portion of the hearing. And the department does respectfully disagree with that suggestion because a victim's views concerning an offense and a youth may be relevant at other times during a delinquency proceeding. For example, they may be relevant to whether or not a case should be transferred either to or from the criminal division. Um, it may also be relevant to what conditions of release should be imposed, which can be very important for safety planning, something that both the center and the network noted. Um, and it may also, their views may also be relevant to whether or not the interests of justice warrant not referring a case to diversion. And I'd also note that the language that's proposed to be included in this section already appears in 5288A2, which pertains to youthful offender cases and accomplishes the same thing in a youthful offender case. So the family division does have some experience implementing this exact language, and the department respectfully asks that it remain as presently worded in the bill. Thank you, yeah. um, I had another clarifying question, just trying to make sure I understand the department's position. So, um, because I heard you say at the onset of your testimony that you kind of support the bill at this point is passed by the Senate. I also, so you were responding to um, the suggestion from some witnesses that, that we consider um adding reckless endangerment aggravated assault and aggravated domestic assault and i heard you say the department had said that the universe of crimes might be too small you hadn't you hadn't um identified any particular crimes that should be added but then you noted that those are listed crimes and may be more serious i'm just so i'm just i felt like i was i'm trying to understand are you just sort of saying are you saying the department agrees with that that those crimes should be added or more just saying we're just kind of commenting on that, that but you support the bill as in its current form i'm just trying to parse out your what the, the position is there. Yeah, so so we're not affirm the department's not affirmatively asking for the committee to add either of those offenses into this bill. Um, the the point of the comment was to just express that when if if the committee is going to take up that consideration and decide, you know, 
when we're looking at the existing list of big 12 offenses, you know, should, should something like a domestic assault an aggravated domestic assault or reckless endangerment be included? Does it rise to the level of one of those other big 12 offenses? Uh, the department just thought maybe it would be helpful to the committee's deliberations to point out that those offenses are listed crimes and that for listed crimes, victims do enjoy a few more rights. So while it's just information that we were providing to the committee in case the committee thought it was helpful in its deliberations, but we're not, the department is not itself asking um, to add any new crimes to this bill. Thank you. Appreciate that clarification. Okay. So, so hi, Evan. So backing up to page 10, the lettering there where you started on four, that lettering doesn't make any sense. If we continue from the paragraph up above, and then when we lose that upon request two, and then it goes to be notified, doesn't make much sense to me. Maybe I'm missing something here. Yeah, so that section on page 10, four, is actually subsection A4. So you actually have to go all the way up to page eight and, and start with 5234A. And so, what, so how it would read if you skipped all of the in-between stuff, would, it would say the victim in a delinquency proceeding involving a listed crime shall have the following rights. And then you skip down to page 10 and then it would say to be notified by the agency having custody of the delinquent child. Okay. All right. Thanks for that clarification. Thank you. Any other questions? Anything else, Evan? No, thank you very much for your time. Great. Great. Well, thank you for able to get all of you in. Okay. It's very helpful. Okay, so great. So we are done with um, with this for now, for S224 for now, with our testimony. Um, I did want to vote for this Bible. Thomas, I'm not sure where. Or I still need to vote, too, on the last mm -hmm. one, right? Oh, okay, I thought you said yes. I did oh, say yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I need it. Oh, I could I put it in the store. Yeah. Right. Okay, good. I just want to make sure it got in there. Great. Um, Thank you. Sure, Thomas. All right, let's do it.